morning, everyone. Can everyone hear us okay? Um, congratulations for making it to a 9 a.m. talk on the second day of a conference in Miami. Um, well done, all of you. <laughs> I still hope everyone was drinking somewhat last night so we don't get too many probing questions later, because um, we certainly were. Um, okay, so I think, I think uh, just to introduce myself, my name's Daniel Hall. I'm a director at Burford Capital, the listed litigation fund and I specialize in effectively funded asset recovery or funded enforcement. And to my right is Warren Gluck, who's an attorney at Holland and Knight in New York. Um, and Warren and I work on some cases together, and we both work with other people in this room and who are not at this room, but at this conference. Um, I think the purpose of today's talk is to take you through, I suppose, some of our thinking when approaching large cross-border multi-jurisdictional enforcement matters some of the techniques that we use, uh, how that plays into the overall recovery strategy um, and trying to get ourselves and our clients to the best possible place from their single piece of paper entitling them to money to actually turning it into cash. I think the first thing to say is building on a few of the themes that we've heard from yesterday from some of the excellent speakers. Um, there's been a huge amount of focus obviously in relation to the Panama Papers in recent weeks. Um, I think for us and for many in this room, that has, I suppose, elevated a thorny issue into the public consciousness, probably in a way that it hasn't been before. Um, obviously, I'm fascinated to see what comes out of the database, which I understand is being published next week. Um, but for us and for people in this room, it's all too familiar. Um, and you start to understand and see some of the structures being used to whether it's for tax uh, efficiency purposes, tax evasion, or for uh, avoiding your judgment creditors, makes little difference to us. But we've heard a lot about the Panama Papers in recent weeks. I think some of the talks yesterday were quite instructive as to, for example, in Brooke's talk, the psychology of how wealth managers perceive themselves um, and you know the service that is they're doing. We've heard lots of talk about how Panama Papers are changing the world and there will be more transparency in the future and increased government rhetoric. But I think the focus of this talk today is that all sounds great and the whys, and the whys are to a certain extent irrelevant. If you are a judgment creditor today, what is it that you can do to improve your position? If you're into a circumstance where you have a serious judgment or a serious debt effectively and you have someone with the means of paying it, whether it's a person a company or a country, and they have taken a proactive decision not to pay you, what can one do about it? Because all of the tools that you've been hearing about and seeing in relation to the Panama Papers are available to them. And their lawyers, whether they are repentant or unrepentant about using those kind of mechanisms, um, will happily use them to thwart your interests. So I suppose we're coming at it from a, trying to be practical in terms of what one does. And I think uh, probably at this point it's worth touching on the basis and the reason for Burford becoming involved in this space. Um, I know some of you obviously recognize and understand a bit about litigation funding, the principle of if you have a meritorious claim but you lack the resources or you don't want to incur the risk of taking it to trial, people will go to an outside source of funding. Um, in the market there are a few people like that um, and some of them are very good and some of them are, are less good. What we're doing at Burford and in my team particularly is funded asset recovery which apart from one or two um, other quasi-competitors, isn't really being done in any way, shape, or form. This is where we are looking at judgments, looking at arbitral awards, and seeing if we can turn those pieces of paper into money. And some of the things we're going to talk about today is, is, is lifting the lid on some of the strategies we use. The reason it's worth mentioning the funded piece, it's not just a shameless plug, but I think it does reflect the real scenario that most judgment creditors face, chasing dyed-in-the-wall recalcitrant debtors. I think the days of, you know, I, I used to be a lawyer, I used to be an investigator, and now I'm working in a finance company. So I, I wear different hats and I see it in different ways. But I think if you're looking at a number that you're chasing that's north of $10 million across multiple jurisdictions, I think the day of here is a $10,000, $20,000 private investigator's report to find assets are probably long gone. Investigators play a very valuable role in the recoveries that we do, but I think this is a very different prospect to, here's a report, thanks very much, let's go off and try and put a lien on the house, or seize the boat or seize the yacht. It's just not that simple. 
So because of that, and because of the financial dynamics, this is a, an area which has been crying out for funding for a while. And using the know-how of people like Warren, some of the people in this room, the application of capital with that know-how is genuinely making a difference to how some judgment creditors can have their, have their debts realized in some way, shape, or form. Um, but it requires investment, and often substantial investment. And I think the thing that people don't often appreciate or want to hear is quite often, if you're unlucky, it can almost cost as much as the underlying case itself. Um, I'm sure people have been in a situation with their own clients where they've, where they've either heard or been told, we don't want to throw more good money after bad, which is an entirely understandable sentiment. The way that we are approaching asset recovery is it is an investment. It is not a loss mitigation exercise. And if you approach it as a loss mitigation exercise, you will sadly most likely fail because if you look at some of the concepts, some of the structures being mentioned over the last day or two, if you consider your own personal experience, trying to do anything and make a substantial recovery on a shoestring budget is, it's, you're asking for Leicester City's recent Premier League success at 5,000 to one to be replicated in a commercial setting, which um, it's not a good bet to make often. So I think today we're going to talk, and Warren and I will kind of jump in and talk over one another a bit, but I think we're going to talk about the way that we approach these things, the desire for ensuring that as many facts at the outset are known, and then deploying the best strategy that you can come up with in the circumstances. You need creative lawyers, you need money, and frankly, you need a lot of luck. And people don't like to admit that, but it's, it's a pretty core part of what it is we do. But if you don't have the first two components, the third is irrelevant. So I think historically there's been an awful lot of focus in the asset recovery scenario of trying to build a war chest. I mean, Warren and I were discussing before we started today that you know, typically the way these things were done is whether it's a liquidation or whether it's a general commercial recovery, one has to try and think where's the low hanging fruit? Let's get the low hanging fruit and let's build from there. The opportunity that creditors have with funding available to it is you are not limited to approach these cases in that fashion. What you are able to do is recognize where the low hanging fruit is for the investor and for the judgment creditor. They realize that's where they will get their money back. They are not fe the creditor is not feeling the bleed throughout the process because the funder is picking up the tab. And actually the desire is when you strike, you're trying to do so in more of a blitzkrieg style fashion. It's literally kind of pick a day, months ahead, and try and work in a strategy where you've identified assets, so you're not just getting the low-hanging fruit, but some of the stuff towards the middle of the tree, and perhaps even some of the stuff towards the top. And the ideal scenario, I think, at least in my experience, and I'd be interested in your thoughts, is trying to ensure that on D-Day, your, your bad guy um, is getting phone calls from a number of different jurisdictions on the same day because you've managed to launch ex parte freezing injunctions over all of his, his or her assets at once. And frankly put you in a considerably stronger position for the rest of the litigation going forward. But that requires substantial investment. No, I, I agree. I'll, I'll introduce myself in just a second. But this is, this is the, a bit of the game change that we've seen in the last few years with, with companies like Burford. Until now, the pressure to perform early has been substantial. The pressure to obtain that low-hanging fruit and build your litigation war chest with your enemy's resources. That has been the model. It's been a model for a number of reasons. It's been a model because the clients like it. When you show initial success, it, in their initial thinking, sometimes means that you will have success down the road. It also means that for a small, in a very small initial investment, you can, uh, further the case with what's frankly a minimalist approach. But what's the problem with obtaining that initial low-hanging fruit? Well, you've shown your hand, and you've shown your hand at the beginning of the case. You've let the other side know exactly what you know, because they'll know what you haven't figured out yet. What you think is 100% of the low-hanging fruit may only be 25%, and they may say, oh, well, how bad, could, how, 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 how bad can they want this when they haven't even figured out X, Y, and Z yet? So there's a prematurity to the low hang, the old model 
that is beginning to change. I, 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 think, I think once we have a few more years of statistics, we may be able to compare success under the war chest model versus success under, under what we'll call the blitzkrieg model. And of course, the Blitzkrieg model is much easier for the award holder to swallow if the litigation is being funded because they don't need to worry about that initial return. Somebody's taking care of it for you, which relieves you of the time pressure. To backtrack just a second, hello, my name is Warren Gluck. I'm an attorney with Holland and Knight. I principally act in the area of litigation, fraud, and asset recovery. Uh, today's presentation builds off something that Dan and I put together in London. It's intended to be a sort of master class, an advanced seminar on how to achieve good results for clients with, while still minimizing investment, but truly maximizing recovery. What you're going to hear today are uh, from two sides of the table, the investigative and the funding side, and then the litigation side techniques and best practices that recently have yielded results. Um, I think really Peter should be leaving at this point. <laughs> Unrepentant Peter should be leaving at this point. Um, but earmuffs Peter, okay. When we talk about how to t approach a case, I think the, the very first thing you need to do, I mean Dan was talking about the $20,000 investigator report. Well, that is helpful. Uh, not that we're going to put that in front of a judge, but everything in the beginning of the case is generally consists of inadmissible leads that will ultimately result in admissible evidence. And this is the one area where I think a lot of attorneys turn their head the wrong way. What they'll say to their client is, oh, great, I can't use it. Come back to me when you have something I can use. And actually, the approach should be, oh, you've generated information, let me see how I can turn that information into admissible evidence. How do I take that hearsay and find the witness to put him under oath and get a statement based upon personal knowledge? Uh, how is it that an initial lead on a bank account in, let's say, an offshore jurisdiction or a bank account in a secrecy jurisdiction from Liechtenstein to Switzerland can be turned from a rumor or a lead into reality. And those are the types of concepts we'll be describing today. Another major one is, uh, comes frankly from uh, someone I've been working with a lot lately who comes from law enforcement. Law enforcement can provide many lessons in the civil context, in, in particular as to how to build a case what they've been good at, certainly beginning with the RICO Mafia style prosecutions beginning in the 1970s, is realizing that not everyone needs to be put on trial. Sometimes, and it's particularly in the civil context, there will be actors against whom you have a cause of action. And maybe the gut is we should sue everybody that was involved in this. File the lawsuit, we'll get our judgments, and and that will be that. But if we're dealing with dollars and cents, Jim, we're trying to obtain good results for the client. And so if middle manager X, who happens to know a lot of information, and you may have a great claim against him because his signature is actually on a lot of the documents, if he's only got a net worth of $50,000, well, how better can he be used? Is there a way to make his life livable in the future but have him help you at the same time. And what we're talking about is witness flipping. What we're talking about is the tactic by which you build your case toward the main event via the flipping of witnesses who you're ultimately going to bring to testify at trial. That middle manager may have the critical information, and we'll talk about narrative in a second, the critical information that you're going to need to win your trial against the deep pocket, against the principal, against the UBO. I'm going to share one little quick story on this, and I know Dan has its own. I'm working on a case now that involves a natural gas fraud, capital F fraud. 
principal, he's now deceased, died in jail. The IRS nabbed him on tax evasion, but before he was incarcerated, he robbed a lot of people of their life savings. And he did so with virtual impunity. Despite state regulatory agencies filing cease and desist, he still managed to obtain investment over a period of years, and then even managed to artificially, it appears, encumber all of his assets and then the assets of the enterprise via a third party creditor. Well, we via a team have managed to get witnesses that were formerly within his organization and were his family members to explain exactly what it is that he was up to. Now it's a little easier now because he's dead. But I'll tell you something. When we didn't do that, by the way, it's probably worth clarifying. No, we were not responsible. But I will say, when fraudster's daughter comes to the stand to testify at trial, I think the jury is going to be fairly moved. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about advanced techniques that, that result in recovery. When you've got to put your money where your mouth is, and you've identified a fraud, and you start getting resistance. The question is, how are you going to build your case, and then how are you going to win your case? I mean, I think that's an excellent example of the kind of tactic you use, but I just want to take a step back again just for a second, where the approach and the need for the investment is to put as many chess pieces on the chessboard as is possible. Now, you will never know everything up front. You just won't. But I think that many of the people at this conference and in this room have a slightly different appreciation of how one does asset recovery than I would than I would describe your garden variety commercial litigator. But the blunt truth is that most cases where you're trying to get a recovery are conducted by garden variety commercial litigators or arbitrators. And what one has to do is rather than base your strategy around the existing facts, you need to invest to give you as many facts as possible up front and then create your strategy. I think there is too blinkered a view that goes on at the moment where people say, well, actually, we can't do this. We're stuck. We don't have the evidence. But ultimately, you have to take a step back and think, what do you think is happening in the real world? You know, you cannot pull evidence out of thin air, but at the same time, you don't have to run with what you ultimately believe is a bad case. So you need to spend the time, spend the money, and really invest in every possible way to ensure that you have as many facts as possible at hand because it dramatically increases your chances of utilizing different legal doctrine, doctrines in different jurisdictions, going after multiple pots of cash, um, and finding yourself hopefully in a situation where you bring your counterparty to the table in a meaningful way. Um, I think you know, some of the things we'll talk about today, Warren, Warren is going to, I think, speak for quite a, an extent on some of the very creative cutting edge discovery methods that I know he's been pioneering in New York. Um, from my experience, obviously coming from the other side of the pond, there are various techniques where I think I can talk about sensibly, um, where you can get over and above what I would call traditional public record information. So for example, in Europe, no, not in the UK, because it's terrible, but you know, in other mainland European countries, there is um, a huge advantage to becoming a civil plaintiff in criminal proceedings. And guess what? If there's not criminal proceedings underway, if there's a, a capital F style fraud, then you can commence them. It's not easy. Um, it differs country to country. In places like Switzerland, it differs canton to canton. My friend Eve Klein is sitting in the audience, who I know is a, <laughs> any, any help in Geneva, go to him. But, but this is a scenario whereby you are not seeking to obtain information improperly, but you are getting away from Google, away from public records. You are riding on the back of, for example, a public prosecutor who has considerably more powers to order banks in Switzerland in the traditional kind of secrecy jurisdictions to provide information as part of his or her own investigation. And as a civil plaintiff, you can actually sit there and get access to it. It's a two-way street. You start seeing information that you would not be able to get in any normal course of events. You know, I've seen examples recently of fraudulent banks filing their own suspicious activity reports. You know, banks who are banking individuals of interest, shall we say, and who knows if they ever get tipped off in their compliance office with anonymous kind of messages, sending judgments to them, sending fraud, criminal investigations, bad media articles. 
and some sweet compliance officer at the bank has to file a suspicious activity report. And that goes upstairs, and it typically goes to that country's financial intelligence unit. What you can do, if you can play on the personal relationships of the lawyers who specialize that in this particular jurisdiction, go and see the financial intelligence unit, unit guys, sit with them, talk to them, explain how you're a victim as well. Not always, but often you can get granted access to the file. So you can actually start seeing bank records by the back door, effectively. There's nothing improper, there's nothing illegal, but what you are doing is you are manipulating the system in a certain way. And I think, again, this gets away from the kind of garden variety style, I have, I have pulled all the available public records. That is crucially important, and it's a, an avenue of inquiry that you should never um, fail to do. But this, this is kind of taking that process on somewhat. And I think when you, when you pull it all together and you combine what you find publicly, what you can find via um, a criminal investigation, especially in Europe, what you can find via some of the discovery methods that I know Warren's going to talk about, what you can find in relation to genuine proper work with sources, um, whether you're going to flip them and use them as witnesses, as Warren's just discussed, or whether or not you are just putting in the time and effort to get the information. You find yourself in a situation where you have a a wealth of data, a huge amount of data over and above what you have uh, on a starting date. And then you have to sit with creative professionals, jurisdiction by jurisdiction, and say, how can we use this? Because guess what? Three months ago, we couldn't make an alter ego argument and go after companies A, B, C, D. But now we can. And I think that the failure of a lot of asset recovery work, and this will be interesting when hopefully statistics are produced in, some, in, in due course, is the, the lack of the upfront investment which has developed for entirely organic reasons from judgment creditors, but it's the root cause of most failure. So this is the kind of thing we want to discuss today. So I think, I think as part of this, as well, I think as part of this, as well as gathering the data, it obviously, the first thing you're looking for are assets. The first thing you're looking for is, hey, have we found the hidden Swiss bank account, Liechtenstein account, all the, all the good stuff. A key part of this is actually understanding your counterparty, but really understanding your counterparty. You know, I think everyone hides behind or, or wants to believe that actually there's a few pressure tactics one could normally bring, and that should result in a check being written. I mean, I've seen, I've seen very credible lawyers, very credible judgment creditors who are sitting there talking about a hardcore fraudster saying, well, actually, if I get a couple of negative press articles about him, he'll want to settle because he'll feel it's low to pressure. And I'm sitting there saying, no, it's not. You know, this is, it's public record. This guy is guilty of fraud. You know, if you get a negative media article out about him, he is not going to open his checkbook and cut you a check for $40 million. That just doesn't really happen. However, there are circumstances I've seen when you have potentially listed companies, big institutions who are concerned about their reputation, people seeking to raise money to, to do a deal somewhere, where actually some public awareness, you know, if someone illuminates some of the practices that have perhaps gone on, can be a very effective tool. So as part of this process, you really have to know your enemy. And I, I hate saying it, but you do have to play the man as well as the ball. That's not me being sexist, you can play the woman as well, that's fine. Um, but, but, but ultimately, that's what it comes down to. You know, there are, there are sweeping things that are always going to work. You know, if you've got a $50 million judgment and you're lucky enough to find a Swiss bank account in your judgment debtor's name, <laughs> with all the money in there and you freeze it, then congratulations, you're in, you're in good shape. That's a fantasy that occasionally does happen, but all too rarely. And what you are typically doing is entering into a war of attrition. And if you give yourself the best and most aggressive starting point, you give yourself the best chance of getting the highest settlement value. And as part of that, you've got to understand what concerns your counterparty and how to deal with it. And to tell your fantastic anecdote about your Chinese chap. Yeah, this, this is a, this is a, I think a, it's a good playing the man uh, and understanding your decision maker story. I'll, I'll give two quick ones. We were representing a consortium of insurance companies a little while back. Uh, those insurance companies had insured a ship uh, on which a chemical that all of you are familiar with was loaded. It's the blue stuff you put in swimming pools. It's called calcium hypochlorite. It turns out, nobody knew this 20 years ago, but it turns out that if you just stack it one on top of another in a normal fashion, it will self-heat and explode. Not a good outcome for a producer, not a good outcome for anyone 
who's charged with transporting this material. The uh, producer, of course, was sued when the, that precise eventuality occurred. Total loss of a very large and very valuable ship as well as all its cargo, about 80 million in total damages. The relevant contract of carriage provided for London litigation. And for 10 years, the liability under this case was litigated, in fact, all the way to the House of Lords, what's now called the Supreme Court in London. Millions of dollars spent just in the liability phase. And the story goes that after 10 years and after the House of Lords upheld the finding against this very large Chinese chemical company, the head of the company uh, flew over to London to take a very high level meeting with this very impressive group of insurers who had convinced themselves that they had won the day. And he walked into the room and apparently in English, even though he doesn't speak it, asked one question. Are English judgments enforceable in China? No. Our offer is zero. And then he walked out of the room, got back on his plane, and returned to China. He came all the way to say that and to send a message. So we got the call basically the next day. And the question was, how are we going to change this gentleman's mind and make it worth his while to pay the judgment? Well, the answer, and we were able to do this via a discovery technique we'll, we'll get into a little later, was that this company and its subsidiaries and affiliates did a, a significant amount of business in the United States. They were sending their product, whether it was the blue stuff you put in swimming pools or other chemicals that they were producing, to everyone from Procter & Gamble to small uh, uh, middlemen in Illinois. So what I did was file 18 actions. 18 actions in 18 different U.S. jurisdictions. One effectively in every jurisdiction where they had a customer. And really I didn't care whether the cost of the individual action was going to be cost effective because what the answer was, sir, sometimes we would catch 500,000, sometimes you catch 50,000, sometimes you catch 10, sometimes you catch a million. But on the whole, and as we started to expand the net to subsidiaries, affiliates, we, they started to react route payments to other companies, which was, of course, the worst thing they could have done because that just gave every judge the justification they wanted to allow these attachment orders to expand and to pierce the corporate veil. N about nine months later, when they couldn't enter into any more joint ventures because every one of their joint venture partners was certainly aware that they were dodging judgments, when they could no longer do business in the United States because, or they could, but they just couldn't be paid for it, uh, we got an email in the middle of the night. We want to settle. And I th my recollection is that we required a million dollars just to sit at the table, non-refundable. That case is an example of finding pressure points. What we caught, and this is a matter of public record because they're all public cases, was little north of five million. That's what we seized of this $80 million judgment. But what we got was a settlement that was acceptable to all of the principals involved. Another story about playing the man was that about last year, a little, about 18 months ago now, we, a lot of people talk about piercing the corporate veil, but we went to trial and pierced the corporate veil at trial in a verdict. And the big question was this kid who's younger even than me, had popped up out of nowhere with a billion dollars in revenues. He was running a major set of companies, shipping companies, commodity trading, the whole nine yards, and everyone was scratching their heads. How in the world did a 27-year-old kid at least, at the very minimum, have this starting capital to start engaging the trading that he was involved in? His father had run a company out of Greece that company went bankrupt in 2008. So we were staring at it, and what we ended up doing and sitting in a room for many, many hours was to put ourselves in this kid's position. You're working at your father's company. It's going bankrupt. At the same time, you're seeing opportunity everywhere. So how do you do it? 
You take money out of your daddy's company with your daddy's blessing. Set up your new company, and suddenly you've got all the working capital in the world. And it was tough to prove. We'll get into how we did it with this wire tracing technique in a, little, in a second, because he used what some call money changers and what some call money launderers, sort of New Zealand LPs, where you send a million seventy thousand dollars and then some goon in Ukraine shows up with a million dollars cash in a bag to effectuate the transactions. But what we did was sit there and say, well, okay, for transaction one, what did he need? How much exactly would he have needed to get his first transaction off the ground? And so we brought an expert, relevant commodity trader shipping guys, and say, okay, what did, what did he actually need to do this? Pay the fuel, pay the costs, pay the charges. And we came up with a number that was about $100,000 off the $3 million and change that he actually needed, and we proved it at trial, and it turns out he took exactly that out of the company. People are people. They're trying to accomplish goals. So if you can put yourself in the head and say, well, if I'm trying to do this, how am I going to do it? I'm not going to do more than I need. I'm going to do exactly what I need. And that's how that case, we ended up we ended up showing it, and we figured out that his internal ledgers actually proved it after, of course, the realization. And that's how you play the man. Yeah, but I think at, at that point, it's probably worth uh, fixating on one of the points on the slide, which is commercial proportionality versus just winning and or revenge. Because as you say, people are people. And if you're a judgment creditor, mm -hmm. and you have been, let's say, for example, defrauded, and you have been chasing your baddies to the ends of the earth and having to jump through all these hoops and use very clever techniques to chase them, you don't want to settle. You want, you know, I've, I've worked with many people who've kind of said at the start, I will accept nothing less than this person being in jail. And then they get billed every month for six months, nine months, a year. Depends what their personal tolerance level is. And then they go, actually, I just want commercial recovery. When is the billing going to stop? And I think, and again, this is an issue where funders help. But I do think that the strategy one has to employ chasing down a large debt um, you, you really need to spend some time at the start of it thinking, what is achievable here? What is the number we are genuinely going for? You know, if people just say, hey, I've got an arbitral award for $200 million, I will not accept a penny less than $200 million, you're in for a very different fight than if you're sitting there thinking, well, actually, I would be very happy with 100 or 50 or whatever else it is. And you employ a strategy based on where you want to end up as opposed to just what the next step in the process is. But in terms of in terms of playing the, um, the man and not the ball, this is true for, for countries as well. So I worked on a while ago um, a case against the Republic of Georgia. Um, this is technically, the case is not public, but the facts in this chart, which no one is allowed to photograph or ever use for themselves, is all based on public information. And it's a good example. So, you know, you are faced with the traditional sovereign immunity issues, as you always have chasing any country. You're faced with the issues of uh, the separate, you know, state-owned enterprises, you know, and assets of the state-owned enterprise do not really count for assets of the, of the sovereign country. And how does one go about bringing pressure or bringing a country like Georgia to the table? And, you know, the debt wasn't enormous. It wasn't hundreds of millions of dollars, but it was sizable and worth collecting. And actually, we sat down went through the process as if it was an individual or a company and thought, what can we put on the table that you can actually pursue and what is going to cause maximum pressure as well as maximum recovery? And one of the things we identified, and it's based on a legacy power plant, they were in effectively a joint venture with the Russian government. There was a, a power station and they assumed the, re the repayment of certain loans. And where it ended up because of legacy transactions is you have a power station jointly owned by the Russians and the Georgians. But for tax reasons, it was all structured out of the Netherlands. And so that was quite helpful, because what you could then do is, in a relatively straightforward fashion, show that sovereign immunity didn't apply. It was money being used for a commercial purpose. It was money going directly to the state of Georgia and not one of the state of enterprises. And you managed to freeze the account in the Netherlands in this joyful, transparent jurisdiction. Now, it wasn't a huge amount of money we froze. It wasn't, it wasn't enough to cover the judgment debt, but it comes down to playing the man. Because what actually happened behind the scenes is someone I imagine very high in the Russian political administration contacted someone in the Georgian political administration and said, you really need to pay your debts and get this stuff sorted. And no word of a lie, two days later, the Minister of Justice and the Deputy Minister of the Interior were on a plane to sit down and discuss with my client 
confidential settlement terms where I know they received the best part of 95% of what was owed. So it's just another example of, of knowing your opponent and investing the time, money to understand if you're going to hit them, hit them where it hurts. Um, and I think one of the last things I'll talk about is what I would call jurisdictional arbitrage. So some of the talks we touched on yesterday was talking about the, the issues that we see with Panama Papers, the issue we see with wealth managers, you know, capital without borders, you know, the ability of wealth managers to, to use different systems in different countries to their quite legitimate, unrepentant advantage um, in terms of putting things in certain places. Well, to a lesser extent, the rules are true for us too. There are certain things we can do in certain jurisdictions you can use elsewhere that perhaps you wouldn't naturally think of. And it's, uh, I give an example of a case I was working on a while ago. And I suppose this is also going to touch on when I talk about really taking the time to work with sources. Um, we were chasing a questionable Venezuelan gentleman who owed my client the best part of $100 million. Um, nice guy. He, uh, ripped off a lot of people uh, in his employ, and one of the people we found was his former CFO. And, you know, obviously, potentially very interesting target to speak to, but again, this is not something that you can do lightly or easily or quickly. And this chap lived in Plano in Texas, and I live in the UK, um, but I managed to <laughs> convince the client it was worth sending me to Texas five or six times over the course of three or four months which was a considerable investment on their behalf, but they were rarely, for a client, willing to make it. And I got to know this guy. I built a rapport. We got on very well. I went to his house. I ate his wife's cookies. You know, I, I assured them that everything was going to be okay if he helped. And what it ended up with is him giving me a stack of Swiss bank documents about this high. And that's great. And you're thinking, isn't, isn't that wonderful? So what then happened, and this gets to my jurisdictional arbitrage point, we were about to launch a blitzkrieg-style attack on our Venezuelan chap. There was going to be simultaneous action in the UK, the US, and Switzerland. And I turn up like a happy puppy dog wagging my tail with, with two boxes of Swiss bank documents, thinking, aren't I jolly clever? And what then happened is the US lawyers went, oh my God, keep them away from me. There's breach of confidence issues. He's a former employee. Stay the hell away. It's terrible. The UK lawyers went, yeah, it's probably okay. We'll just have to full and frank it in the ex parte application. And the Swiss lawyers went, yeah, it's fine. No worries. You do what you want. <laughs> and so this is what then happened. We used the Swiss documents to show that the proceeds of my Venezuelan chap fraud entered into Switzerland. We then convinced a public prosecutor to commence a criminal investigation. We are civil plaintiffs in that. What then happens is the prosecutor gets those records and many others from various banks in Switzerland. We as a civil plaintiff get to see them and then we can use them as the basis of other actions we're doing in other jurisdictions like the United States and like the UK. So whilst the people who help what I would call our judgment debtors hide money, be tax efficient in different places around the world, one of the things we have to always bear in mind is there are tips and tricks and advantages that we can bring to bear that exploit the differences in our respective jurisdictions to our advantage as well. Um, and I think one of the things we're going to come on to now, or in a, in a moment, is Warren's um, cutting-edge discovery techniques. And it's a good example because irrespective of when a case crosses my desk, whether it's the genesis is in Bahrain with baddies in the Philippines or wherever, the first thing I'm always thinking of is the United States. We should do some stuff in the US here. Before we jump into this, there, th this is something that we thought, both of us thought, would be very interesting. And by the way, I'm going to cut back to the jurisdictional arbitrage point for just a second. It exists at the macro level between countries, but this is why it's important to engage someone who's familiar with asset recovery, because it exists at the micro level too. For example, it's helpful to know, and we'll talk about differing US jurisdictions in a second, but that on the whole, the 11th Circuit, Florida, is just a little bit more permissive 
when it comes to 28 U.S.C. 1782 applications than is, for example, New York, especially when you look at some of the recent circuit precedent. The differences between jurisdictions are very real. On a close case, they can make the difference. Um, what is on the screen now is, right now. <laughs> of course, uh, a nice little document, and I have to give credit where credit's due. This was presented uh, to me at a conference where I spoke in Cayman, and I just loved it. It was, pro it was proposed for a completely different proposition. This document is the result of what in the largest judgment recoveries in history. This is the document that resulted in the settlement of the Argentine debt crisis. And for those of you who, who don't know, uh, when Argentine, uh, Ar Argentina issued its bonds and then defaulted, a group of hedge funds uh, principally based in the Western Hemisphere, including in the Cayman Islands and the United States, declined to accept the settlement terms that had then been offered. What ensued was a 10-year war. Uh, my firm helped out, certainly, when you may have heard that a naval ship was seized. That is how uh, serious this action was. But to go back to our initial point about playing the man, playing the ball, a lot of the exercise is exerting pressure to the point, and in this, in this case it took 10 years, where a settlement is possible. We are in the business of obtaining results, and results most often occur via a joint agreement. What you are seeing one step above a cocktail napkin is the agreement between DART, or his hedge fund, and the minister of the Argentine finance government totaling $1.6 billion that they just hashed out. And there's no choice of law clause. There's no jurisdiction clause. It is a, McCarter in English was obviously involved somehow. But these were two gentlemen, principals, sitting in a room who had decided after an appropriate amount of litigation in both of their views to settle a case. It was, it, yes, this was, this was, I believe, Dart's uh, fund, or he was at least a, a principal of it. But it's, it's, it's an interesting slide. It's something we wanted to share here because it really drives home the point of what you need to do is create a strategy to win. And winning doesn't always just mean winning every motion in court. What it means is obtaining the results your client wants, which in most of these cases is money. Um, We've discussed here the importance of jurisdictional arbitrage. It's obviously important to have a good team in place. What we are talking about in so many of these cases is an international recovery effort. And so you need experts in every, you, you need to know ahead of time that you're going to need in a forensic accountant. And you need a good one. And you need one who will not fold under cross and who will stand by his opinions. Some of the time that are based on supposition on inference, because after all, we're dealing with people who are trying to conceal their behavior. You need to know the buzzwords, the watchwords, the, the forms of action that exist in every jurisdiction. One of them has proved to be of some importance over the last few years. Um, it's something that I've been doing a lot of work in, and it's something that has some partially changed the game when it comes to tracing assets on a worldwide basis. I call it intermediary bank discovery. And intermediary bank discovery is premised on a fairly simple proposition. Any US dollar wire transfer from anyone in the world to anyone in the world. So we're talking Cayman Islands to India. If it's a US dollar transfer, it will clear through the New York banking system. Now, if you've ever wondered, how exactly does OFAC, the Office of Foreign Asset Control, know when some Norwegian ship insurer 
is providing coverage to an Iranian oil company for its tankers. How do they know that? Well, it's because the payment premiums are flowing through the U.S. And for years, for decades, the United States government has tapped into and required the various financial institutions engaged in this activity to maintain meticulous records of every transfer they process. And it's not just a requirement, it's good practice for the banks. The banks want to know what they are doing because tens of thousands of transactions are processed every day. What we have begun doing for the last five years, uh, and it started off as an experiment, and I think now it's safe to say it's fairly well established, is utilizing those records in the civil context. If you know what you're doing, you can obtain the complete US dollar financial history of any person or entity in the world under appropriate circumstances. And that's what we're talking about here today. It does require a case. It requires the use of the court power. It requires the use of the subpoena. That being said, it's available in a wide variety of cases, principally useful in what we're talking about here. Judgment enforcement, arbitral award enforcement, fraud investigation, cross-border insolvency. In all of those cases, the usefulness of these records is so clear that it's almost a no-brainer. So to put things in context just a little bit, what are we talking about? When I say we're getting all, every record, we're getting every record. If I was to point this at an, the, an organization that perhaps someone in the crowd's involved in, if law firm, an accounting firm, what would I find out about your enter for enterprise if I saw every wire transfer you received or made? Well, I'd know where every bank account in the world you operated from was located. That bank account is off, doesn't have to be in the United States to receive a US dollar wire transfer. So we see Swiss accounts and Cayman accounts and Bahamas accounts every single day. I would know who every one of your customers and counterparties are. I would know who, where they do business. I would know when they pay you. I would know when you pay them. I would know everything about you. And that's how we begin these cases now, by learning everything there is to know about your adversary. And I, th I think one of the things that's very interesting doing this repeatedly is you start to see the wire references as well. So as well as company A paying company B and you get the account coordinates, you actually see what the payer or the payee says. You see, this is for the payment of this expense. This is for payment of vessel ABC, whatever it is. You know, it, it's a, as well as providing the account coordinates and giving you an insight into the fund flows, you start to build the case for when you want to bring an alter ego argument, when you want to bring a constructive trust argument later on, when you want to kind of widen your net and go after entities that are not necessarily your judgment debtors. Um, this is what it enables you to do. It's, um, it's, a, it's a crucial grounding of a lot of the asset recovery work that we do. I agree. Quick, quick joke and then two stories about the references. I have a case now where there is a multi-million dollar transfer and the reference is kittens for business. Think about it. What in the world is that for? Now I've got a couple ideas. But people write down why they are sending money. They have to. Nobody who's operating a major enterprise can keep everything in their head. So you have to know why you were sending money. And often the references can break the case. Two quick examples, one of which we've touched on earlier today, or three of which we've touched on earlier today. How did I know where the Chinese chemical company was going to be doing business in the US? By this. How did I know when the receivables were going to come in? How did I know if I had a week or two weeks to hit the uh, US customer with the attachment order before they were going to make their payments? You just study the documents and you say, oh, you know, Sigma Aldrich or Procter & Gamble, they're on a quarterly billing cycle. So we at least have two weeks before that one, so I went to hit the, uh, a different company first. Um, an example of where the references truly cracked the case was the one we were talking about with the young gentleman who had amassed his billion dollar in revenue empire. Um, the 
the references we start to see over and over again were very, very strange. Meat, spare parts, uh, cookies, things that did not make sense. And that's how we figured out that these, what we had, we had stumbled upon was a network of money changers. A network of short-lived entities that are set up in a variety of jurisdictions that provide the service of transporting and money across borders in cash. Of course, there has to be physical money at the beginning of the day. So the, when we figured out finally what we were dealing with, we went back to, again, the Greek company owned by his father. And that's how we, we, we cracked the case. We figured out that right at the end, there were a couple of transfers out for meat and spare parts. And it was those transfers that ultimately made their way into the hands of the young gentleman who used the cash to start his business. Another example is that we were dealing with a, a BVI liquidation. And uh, there were a number of creditors, about 80, 100 million dollars worth of creditors. And they had, the, effectively, this was a situation in 2008 where the whole world had gone to hell. Freight rates were down 98%. Um, just for comparison, the, what brought down Lehman and Bear Stearns, if you've, if you've seen the, uh, the, uh, the various movies, was a 10% market correction. This was 98% correction. Very few companies could survive something like that. And this gentleman had gotten into trouble with uh, forward freight agreements under ISDA contracts. But he was, we think, pretty clever. He saw the writing on the wall. He saw this was coming, in fact, before anyone. And what he should have done was done what those, uh, those guys in the movie did and bet against the US economy. But what he decided to do instead was filter around $80 million out of the company into through another BVI company via what we believe were fabricated counterparty agreements and netting agreements that didn't really make sense in retrospect. So as we were staring at all of this, the real question became, okay, where did the, wh where did the money end up? And the references yielded the clue. Second company, second BVI code that received the money, then sent money to a perfectly legitimate seller of very large ships and put in the reference purchasing funds for MV blank. He used the money to buy some new ships with a new company that he started off in Singapore. And this is a little bit issue about narrative. One of those vessels wandered into the United States. And of course, we went to a judge and explained this whole story. Everything from the crash to the siphoning to the whole concept of this intermediary bank discovery with some nice fancy posters. It was in New Orleans, and they have sort of a, an elevated courthouse where you can see the port. And the end of the story is, and that's the ship outside your window. You can see it right now. I think one of the other things to make at this point to make at this uh, juncture is that I don't know about other people in the room, but quite often when I'm brought into some of these asset recovery scenarios, whether it's the investigators or the lawyers, they'll always say, oh, this guy's the cleverest guy you're ever going to go up against. Oh, he's a real genius. Now, this one's a real tough nut. And undoubtedly, that is true some of the time. But I think, you know, security is only as strong as its weakest link. It's a very, it's a very big cliche. But everyone kind of likes to imagine this single individual in a Machiavellian fashion sending wire transfers online in his bedroom. It just doesn't happen that way. There are infra there's infrastructure. Most of the people who are this wealthy don't frankly know what their accounts are, what in the name of what. If you pin them down and inject them with truth serum, which is not a strategy we would do, um, they probably couldn't tell you. But what they'll have is they'll have flunkies, they'll have people. You'll have make a payment here, make this happen. And so even though the, the guy or the girl you're chasing may be the smartest person on the block, you're waiting for the deputy accounts person to put something in the wire transfer reference that, as you say, it cracks the case sometimes. So that's the reason you really have to go into it in that level of granular detail. <laughs> well said. Uh, the, so then the question is, well, how do you do it? How, how, practically speaking, you, you've got a case, 
you, you want to engage in this technique. You want to trace the flow of funds across borders. How exactly do you go about doing it? Well, th there's a number of ways. At a, at, a, at a basic level, and this is, I'm going to talk about how this has been abused via some copycats. So you have to be really careful who you choose to do this. Um, in theory, any litigation in the world in which this documentation will be relevant, so we're talking everything from fraud cases to judgment recovery cases to uh, insolvencies, this can be obtained via 28 U.S.C. 1782, uh, request for discovery in aid of foreign proceedings. Uh, in a Chapter 15 case, by the way, is an excellent way to go about doing this. In fact, it's my favorite because the bankruptcy discovery provisions are among the widest in the United States. For those who are, of you who are uh, foreign-based, you will, I'm sure, always hear, oh, discovery is so crazy in the United States. Well, bankruptcy is even more so. Uh, bankruptcy, for example, is supposed to be a fishing expedition. It is well established that, for example, a foreign liquidator or a U.S.-based trustee can take discovery in relation to future litigation in order to decide whether to commence it. So Chapter 15 is a great way to uh, utilize this technique. I filed a number of Chapter 15s that I call discovery-only Chapter 15s. And the courts have said, no, we're actually here to help. If you are a liquidator, if you're an officer of a foreign court, and you want to investigate the circumstances that led to your company's demise, well, that makes all the sense in the world. And there is no jurisdictional requirement. There's uh, a new micro one, which requires the debtor to have some property in the United States, but it's easily uh, dealt with via a retainer payment. Um, Obviously, in U.S. litigation, this is available. In U.S. fraud cases, anytime you can serve a subpoena, uh, even if you have federal cases are very easy, you just serve it uh, via the relevant federal court. State's a little more complicated, but nothing that can't be handled. If you have a money judgment from any country in the world, there is a unique provision of New York's, two unique provisions of New York statutes that will allow you to engage in this process, in fact, without court order. Uh, the deals and, and without any jurisdictional requirement. The deals as follows. New York courts regard the recognition of foreign money judgments as a ministerial act. That means that they will enforce or, or they'll recognize, I should say, foreign money judgments without any requirement for personal jurisdiction. Another quirk of New York CPLR is that it permits the issuance of discovery immediately upon the filing, the mere filing of an action. So what do we have? We have an action to recognize and enforce a foreign money judgment that has been filed, and we're seeking to discover in relation to that purpose. It's hard to argue that that is not appropriate. Uh, there is an, a, a counter argument based on prematurity. Maybe you should have the judgment recognized first, but that's subject to debate. So in the case of foreign money judgments, it's frankly rather easy. Um, the there have been some headwinds as of late. So obviously, there's, there are some who hear this and attempt it without really knowing what they're doing. So the one case in the 1782 context recently uh, has uh, resulted in an adverse decision. In that particular case, there were two problems that this attorney was trying to work around. One is the Second Circuit, the New York court's reluctance or refusal to uh, allow 1782 applications in relation to foreign arbitrations, period. Um, and, and the second was the fact that there was no uh, arbitration even commenced. So what happened here was that a, an attorney whose client had a claim, a prospective claim, in an arbitration made the argument that I have a prospective arbitration. In connection with that prospective arbitration, my client's going to want to get prejudgment security in some jurisdiction unknown. And we would like to take this type of discovery to uh, ascertain the location where the prospective security action in support of the prospective arbitration would, uh, would commence. That was found to be a bridge too far. 
And if, frankly, if someone had asked me about the same thing, I would have said adverse results can happen, and this is an example of it. Yeah, please don't let anyone break this. It would make me really sad. Um, <laughs> that's the most important right. thing to bear in mind. It, it, it is important Try, it, it, that we are all trying not to, to break it because it has changed the game somewhat in terms of uh, how to approach these types of cases. Now, we've talked about how to use these, these, this technique just a little bit, um, obviously knowing your counterparty inside and out. But amazingly enough, you know, I, we did a version of this talk in London. We talked about this last year to a much more limited extent, but people still don't really know. You know, the, the world writ large does not really know this is out there. So one of the first cases in which we use this, actually it was just to prove a lie. Uh, this was a garden variety commercial dispute. Large commercial dispute, but a garden variety one. And our client had a desire for a number of reasons to bring this case in the United States. and sued the defendant in New York. And the defendant made a motion to dismiss for lack of personal jurisdiction, as so many defendants do. And often those types of motions are well-founded. In fact, I'll tell you after the fact, this motion was fairly well-founded. Except in support of his motion, a officer of the company stated in a sworn statement that the company didn't do business in the United States. Now, we knew for a fact that was wrong because we had knowledge of like a $25,000 transaction with a U.S. company. So we immediately knew he was lying. But what I proposed to the client is, let's see how much he was lying. So we engaged this technique and we found out more than $100 million worth of U.S. transactions. Now, what was the result in that case? Uh, not only was the motion denied, because the judge was a little pissed, but there was a directed verdict issue and attorney's fees awarded. Now, for those of you in the U.S. audience, we don't get attorney's fees very often. Um, but that is because it's just not our system. But it's in occasional bad faith cases, we get them. And they tried to get around it, and they supplied a know-nothing witness who, on a 30 v. 6, and he was asked uh, questions about these $100 million worth of transactions. And his response is he was unfamiliar with the concept of a wire transfer. So it didn't work out that well. Yeah, and I, I just pick up on this point as well. I think especially trying to take ourselves away from the Miami Beach setting and the concept of you know US lawyers understanding discovery. I mean, start thinking about this in the context of mainland Europe. I mean, discovery, disclosure, it just doesn't happen, really, in any, in any sensible, practical way. You know, I regularly have US lawyers saying to me, well, let's just get discovery in France or in Switzerland. And you're sitting there thinking, no, 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 that doesn't happen. Good luck with that. And what I find is you talk to lawyers, asset recovery experts even, in some of these jurisdictions where there are good tools to actually attach bank accounts, to commence criminal proceedings, I've touched on once or twice, or to do various things. But the, the trick of all of these different jurisdictions where bank secrecy is enshrined in the legislation is, yes, if you discover the banking data or the bank account information, there are a host of things we can do. But guess what? You'll never discover it because we have banking secrecy. This is the key to unlocking some of that. You know, I was a few weeks ago, I was in Vaduz in Liechtenstein, which is about four streets big, as I'm sure some of you know. And I sat with a lawyer and he was like, well, you know, yeah, I can do all this stuff here at Liechtenstein, but you'll never find the account numbers. And I pulled out a spreadsheet of accounts that my judgment debtor had at different Liechtenstein banks. And honestly, frankly, the main reason I went to Vaduz is to watch his jaw drop, his eyes bulge, and his socks blow off, which is exactly what happened. I mean, he was, you know, he thought I'd done all kinds of inappropriate, na naughty things, um, which I hadn't. Um, it'd probably be fine in Liechtenstein anyway. But, but you know, I think. In terms of highlighting just how unknown this technique is, and coming back to the point about jurisdictional arbitrage, you can do this stuff in the US and take it and actually use it in jurisdictions where people have no concept. They are walking around thinking, no one will ever find my account. You know, I currently have a case where I've got a $50 million arbitral award against a, a sheikh, a minigarch running around the UAE. And he's sitting there, he's very happy with himself, he's powerful locally. He's, yeah, bring it on, you're never going to be able to get me in the UAE. This guy has got wire transfers going to a US dollar bank account in his own name in a couple of places. He is going to get a really bad shock, 
really soon. Um, and I think that this is not understood or widely recognized, which is an advantage for us. You know, the longer we go out trotting these kind of talks out, we will reduce our operational advantage as judgment creditors. Um, we are very conscious of this. But I, I think it's a, a mechanism that everyone here should be aware of that exists. And when you combine this with getting information from a criminal process in Europe, turning kind of genuine sources or witnesses, getting actual proper in-depth information that way, and doing the traditional, you know, pulling all the public record and all the weird and wonderful places it sits, it's quite a compelling thing to do um, together. It actually provides you with the best possible chance of beating some of the structures you see, um, you know, highlighted by the Panama Papers. But it can't be done in a siloed way. You need to do all of it together, and you need to be lucky. And I'll, I'll just touch on this. This is a, uh, to clarify, this is a, what, what it amounts to a lawful way around certain banking secrecy laws. So there's nothing untoward about it. What we are talking about are a collection of New York banks engaging in New York activity, processing New York uh, situs wire transfers, even if, if it's just for a moment, from their foreign customers. The transfers are processed in New York, the records are generated in New York, the records are stored in New York, and the records are discoverable via ordinary process. What those that Dan was just describing don't realize is that when people think that they have a hidden Swiss bank account, they don't. There are those who know about it. And in fact, every time you send a wire transfer you th from any given account in the world, that account and all of its information is being sent to the United States. You're doing that willfully and you're doing that voluntarily. So there's nothing untoward about this. And, and that's why it's, of course, they're also business records. So under most evidentiary systems, these are no-brainer admissible. And this is what we were talking about initially. I'll tell you, over the last few years, when we started doing this, there's obviously one company on one subpoena, and that was the experiment. Now, this is where we circle back. Inadmissible leads leading to admissible evidence. How do you know how to what names and what entities and what targets to include on your subpoena? Well, you have to start somewhere. And that's where we start with our leads. That's where you develop your case you obtain what you suspect to be a network that you reasonably believe will yield to admissible evidence. And that's the standard for discovery, isn't it? If you genuinely believe that a piece of that a subpoena will lead to admissible evidence, then you can serve. The one thing we keep coming back to, by the way, and this is what's on the, on the, on the, uh, the screen now, is it's a good way to cut through the maze. There's a lot of complexity in these cases. Even now, we're sitting here, you know, talking 45 minutes an hour. Sometimes, especially in the U.S. court system, I know you get a little longer in England, but you need to make your case to the judge in 20 minutes. I was recently timed to make the entire case by a federal judge in New York. I had 10 minutes, 6 minutes for the opening, 4 minutes for the rebuttal. So you need to get your message out quickly. A lot of time it's narrative. You need to explain a narrative that makes sense. Your Honor. I've got a kid with a billion dollars in business, and his father's business seems to have a few million missing from it. The one-line narrative. Now, how did we get there? Well, we spent nine months figuring this out, and we had an expert report that was 150 pages long. But you have to distill it into a narrative that a judge or jury is going to understand. Because again, we're talking about people here. And this is, I keep it on my desk, actually. This are the, these are the old badges of fraud. For anyone who practiced law a number of years ago and who did fraudulent transfers, before the Uniform Fraudulent Transfer Act came out, these were the criteria that courts used to determine whether a transfer was fraudulent. And you look at it, and of course it makes sense. And this is what, in fact, you use on every case on, on, a, on, a, on, a, sublim on, a, on a on a a subconscious level. How am I going to convince a court that what's going on here is fraudulent. And of course, these factors, which were applicable 50 years ago, are still just as applicable today, even if they're no longer codified as the reason to do it. 
Uh, and sometimes the factors are obvious. Uh, there's somebody in the room today, you know, we're working on a case, and the letterhead has typos. The uh, CFO has admitted in writing that all relevant documents concerning the company have been sent to Venezuela. Well, that was an interesting choice. Uh, so sometimes the badges of fraud are obvious. They slap you over the face. Sometimes they're less obvious. Another, an example of less obvious is, is, is number eight, uh, retention of the debtor of possession. So you start to look at some transactions and what, what some clever, or they think they're clever, they talk to do is they nominally transfer ownership but then secretly retain the business. And there are ways to prove that that's the case and this technique is a good way to prove it because somewhere down the line anyone who in fraudulently transfers their business to someone else, they want to get paid at the end of the day. And finding that trail is crucial. Um, The, the, the final part of our presentation today is going to sort of take everything we've described and crystallize it in yet another technique that is on the rise. So the question is, what do you do when you found out that there's money in Swiss accounts, that $100 million has been transferred through Credit Swiss Bahamas? What are you supposed to do? Well. As Dan said, you employ a multi-jurisdictional team to go to war. One disadvantage the United States has had for years over places, the, the, the English common law jurisdictions, we're common law jurisdiction too, but the English common law jurisdiction is that we have been unable to get the so-called Marave injunction, the worldwide freezing order. U.S. Supreme Court about 20 years ago said this was not going to fly in most money damages cases. It has been a hindrance and frankly it has destroyed some value. It's been, it's, I, I personally I think it needs to be reevaluated. But it's not just me. New York has reevaluated. What we've seen since 2010 in New York is a state law based, and of course, you know, this is the laboratory of the state, so it's, it's, it's starting out now, but a state law based answer to the Mareva injunction. We're calling it the global attachment order. It's particularly relevant here because there have only been four cases so far. Every one of them has involved an offshore company. By coincidence, every one of them has been a British Virgin Islands company. I've been involved in every one of the cases at issue. Here's the big picture. The courts have realized that we now live in the 21st century. What is the meaning of property? Property, in many cases today, exists in the form of ones and zeros and is digitally stored in various banks. And so if you think you have in a bank account, what you really have is a debt owed to you by the bank that's maintained in a computer. And the concept of where property is and what property is are being blurred, and rightfully so. It's hard to distinguish. What the New York courts have done is to merge the concepts of personal jurisdiction and jurisdiction over property. In 2010, a New York Court of Appeals case, so it's the highest court in the land, only subject to the Supreme Court, and the holding was not appealed to the Supreme Court. What it held is that where there is personal jurisdiction over a defendant, the New York Court has jurisdiction over all of that defendant's tangible and intangible property anywhere in the world. Very interesting. It came about in a case called Hotel 71. In Hotel 71, what you had is a bunch of angry creditors, mezzanine debt, mezzanine debt holders, fairly upset at their place in the pecking order. And they served a standard New York state law attachment order on the defendant in that case. It happened to be prejudgment, but it's of no moment. The question presented to the court was what was the effect of that attachment order? And I should say they served it on one of the defendants while he happened to be passing through New York. Here you go. Did that attachment order just seize his wristwatch and the 50 bucks in his pocket? 
or did it do something more? And it wound its way up through the courts, and the answer was something much more. What the court held was that all of this gentleman's personal property worldwide was subject to that attachment order. And on pain of contempt, which some care about and some don't, as Dan and I were just discussing. Which I painfully know, which is really frustrating. <laughs> he was not permitted to transfer, encumber, dispose, dissipate any of that property. So when is this really effective? It, it's important to just take a step back and look at some, some procedure and some technique for a minute here. What we're talking about is a targeted order. Does this order apply to banks worldwide? No. Can you serve a New York bank with this type of order and get a worldwide injunction? No. It's a, this is a direct defendant order. So it's very useful if you think you have somebody that you're trying to collect from that cares about being contempt of a New York court. Again, a court with personal jurisdiction over a non-domiciliary present in New York has jurisdiction over that individual's tangible or intangible property, even if the site is the property is outside of New York. So much of what we do here revolves around big money centers like London, New York, Paris, Switzerland. But so many debt agreements have New York forum selection clauses. So many arbitration agreements provide for New York arbitration. What does this mean? It means that in any case, either pre-judgment or post-judgment, in which your case arises from a consent to New York jurisdiction via forum selection clause or an arbitration agreement, New York's answer to the Mareva injunction is available. And then I are working on a case where that's the case right now. But it, in fact, it, it strengthens the case for a New York arbitration clause in a contract. It strengthens the case for uh, New York jurisdiction. It provides options and remedies to those a, 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 with a very specific nexus to New York at this point. I suppose I just want to jump in here and I'm, I'm whilst I qualified as a UK solicitor, I don't think I could credibly describe it having practiced in any way, shape or form and I should never ever provide legal advice. But I know that in the UK there are some fairly creative efforts by the UK courts as well. If equity is on your side and you are chasing a fraudster, judges will often find a way of getting you to an equitable, as equitable a result as they can within the confines of the law. I would advise anyone to look at RBS versus Fal Oil, which is a kind of relatively interesting case out of the UK, where you know the court found it had discretion to order a worldwide injunction, a worldwide Mareva, and a worldwide asset disclosure, despite the fact that the various parties, well, the baddies, were not UK-based. They had no UK business operations. They had no assets in the UK. You know, it's a, it's, it was a big jurisdictional battle. However, the court found that certain elements were in place. There were just about some arguable UK nexus to allow the court to exercise its discretion to then issue worldwide orders in that sense. You know, there are other creative tools being used in the UK which competent UK lawyers should speak about at some point, whether it's equitable receiverships, whether it's reversing transactions under section 423 of the Insolvency Act, which has no time limit on it whatsoever. You know, you, you're in a scenario whereby kind of going back round to the start of the discussion today, arm yourself with as much information as you physically can. This takes months, this takes substantial investment, and it takes some fairly kind of creative mechanisms, whether it's New York discovery, criminal prosecutions in Europe and elsewhere. And then, with the right lawyers who do this day in, day out, and some of them are in this room, sit there and think, what is the most that we can do with this information? How much can we stretch this and either seek the equivalent of a Moreva in the New York courts if New York jurisdiction is present, if not, what can we do in the UK? Can we try and get worldwide freezers, worldwide disclosure orders, despite there not obviously being a UK nexus? And it's hard, it's not easy, but they're the kind of lengths you need to go to and get lucky. If you look at your screen, of the screen now, I want to focus on case three for a minute, because as I mentioned, it happens to be the case that all of these global attachment orders have involved offshore companies so far. And as I said, we just happen to have involved in every single case that has been brought to bear so far. Big takeaways, 
at no point in any given proceeding was it even subject to debate that the given attachment orders in these offshore cases had global reach. In previous years, though, we started saying, well, this, this is an interesting development because it's, it's bigger than an injunction. An attachment order confers priority. It confers secured status. So how do you deal with the contours of what's becoming a global attachment? Last week, we dealt with it. This, it it's, it's now getting to the point, and I'll come back to the evolution of the question mark in a second, but we're getting to the point where even we're dealing with the wrinkles. So in this particular case, an attachment order was entered against a BVI company, global attachment order purporting to seize all assets. We represented a secured creditor of that BVI company. This, had, this, this creditor had registered its security interest in the BVI corporate registry, which is public information, two years before this particular counterparty had even engaged in the transaction that led to the attachment order and went bad. Our client was first in line. What do you do with when a New York court issues a global seizure order in respect of already encumbered assets? This was a big question. This was a question we talked about last year, in fact, with an insolvency practitioner uh, on the panel. How do you deal with it? Um, actually, pretty simply, what we did was submit evidence to the New York court of the secured status and got a ruling. And the net result was not that the global attachment order was somehow not global. It was just subordinated, as it should be, to the already secured status. And I think it's an interesting story because it shows what's become the legitimacy of these attachment orders. We are now getting to the point, and they're only a few years, uh, they're only a few years old, where this process, these Hotel 71 attachments, these global attachments, whatever you want to call them, are now mature enough that the intricacies are being uh, uh, ironed out. Not only that, Florida is examining the very same questions. Um, and the initial results in Florida are different than in New York, and that's fine. They are ex these are hard questions to deal with, nature of property. What Florida has done it appears. Is for the first time they dealt with the issue, they really weren't happy. They were also concerned about, well, what, do you do? what if you have encumbered property? What if you have, you know, the notion of a New York court exercising jurisdiction over foreign property made other courts uncomfortable. It, it was a legitimate question. I think now that we have some of the initial answers in New York, we might go back to some of the Florida judges and explain how this can work in practice. Um, but what's interesting, so in the Sergeant V. Al-Salah case, which I know that Dan has some familiarity with, uh, the answer was no, no, no extraterritorial seizure in the context of tangible property. If it physically exists, you can touch it, and these were share certificates. The answer was no. Uh, but just recently, the Middle District of Florida has answered the question of whether Florida courts may exercise global jurisdiction in, in an attachment context or an execution context over intangible property. And the only distinction were interests in an LLC that were uncertificated versus shares of a company that were, there were certificates. And the answer was totally different. We'll do some questions just in a minute and we'll get through it. But Point being, this is a novel and developing area of the law. We shall see how uh, these cases develop. But um, the answer seems to me there is a very good argument that these types of orders should exist. That in the US, which is obviously such an important center, there should be a capability to exert jurisdiction, when you have jurisdiction over the person, and that's you know, critical, but to issue orders concerning people's property that go beyond the U.S. borders. Frankly, the bankruptcy courts have been doing this for 100 years, and only now do we have the trial courts starting to catch up. I just want to say, by the way, this is distinct from a case that made a lot of waves, but frankly didn't go very far uh, a few years ago. The bottom line premise is these global orders, they work extremely well versus every single defendant except for banks. B 
banks are specially protected, at least in New York. Every branch of a bank is considered a separate entity. And what a lot of people didn't realize when this case came out was this bank, Kohler v. Bank of Bermuda, and Bank of Bermuda was forced to turn over some stock certificates, is that this issue of the separate entity rule had actually been waived within the case. So it, it was a case that had almost no future precedent. And I want to just be clear that th we're not talking about this Kohler case with these Hotel 71 global attachments, because uh, it's often a question that's asked. Uh, very briefly, in the last two minutes, I'm going to pose a question. Um, and it concerns, again, the US dollar money system. And then we'll take uh, some questions if, for those who want to stay for overtime. Um, we talked about how all U.S. dollar transfers go through the United States banking system. And that's the premise of intermediary bank discovery, and it's a good premise, it's a solid premise. There's an even broader premise that most don't like to talk about, but here it is. It's not just that all transfers are going through New York, it's that all the dollars are actually in New York. If you think that you have a foreign U.S. dollar bank account, Actually, you don't. And this is, the, this, is, this is the shockwave. You really don't. What your foreign bank has is an agency agreement with a New York bank where your US dollars are stored. The reason I put this up on the board is it's actually a relatively uncontroversial premise. Um, nominally, the owner of a bank account, the titular owner is the owner of the funds inside that bank account. That's the general rule, but of course, you can prove by evidence that that's not the case. If, I give money to Dan Hall and I say, and we have an agreement where he's gonna hold on to it for me. Well, if I've got a debt, then some creditor ultimately, if he can prove that agreement, can go seize the funds. Okay, here we go. If all dollars are in New York, well, even the Swiss account dollars, even the Bahamas dollars, well, should creditors simply be able to seize those dollars directly in New York? While they may be in the bank account of a Butterfield or an HSBC uh, non-US entity, well, they're actually in a correspondent account in New York. And the fact is, on the criminal side of things, this is already being done. If you ever watch dockets and you see US government versus $17 million or $147 million is the caption, in serious cases, money laundering, drug money, te terrorism in particular, uh, the legal fiction that all dollars aren't in the U.S. is totally disregarded. In fact, it's disregarded by a statute, a very specific statute. It's that statute permits direct access to those U.S. dollars uh, from the New York courts because, of course, the U.S. dollars are in New York and it's deemed to be in New York. The title is a little off, but here's my point. The New York, the interbank attachment statute that is used by the US government cur currently is effectively a codification of a truism. They are put into a statute that all New York dollars are accessible via the New York banks. But it's true anyway. You can explain this to a court. You can explain this to a judge. Some attempts have been initially made. Again, you have to be careful when people hear about things that they actually can follow through. Uh, and make the credible arguments that, under, that underlie the premises. But I'll, I'll direct your attention to the Cargill case that's on the screen. Uh, it is an appellate level case. And at issue was a debtor bank which uh, had creditors in the United States and the creditors went to go seize its correspondent account in New York. Debtor bank comes in and says, okay, yes, we owe you a debt. In fact, we'd love to pay you, but we actually don't have the money. What you have done, Cargill, is something much more than you realize. What you've done is attach all of our customers' money. The money that's in our account isn't literally the bank's money. It's the money of all the people in the former CIS country who had US dollar accounts. And their money was frozen. Now, there was a trial held on this point with evidence submitted. And at the end of the trial, the attachment was vacated. Why? Because it wasn't the bank's money. So the question, and this is something to think about, it's, this is the evolution of the question mark, is five years ago we asked whether intermediary bank discovery might be possible. Answer is clearly yes. Uh, about three years ago we started examining the global attachments and there was a question mark next to that title slide. Uh, we've seen that play out towards the yes column. And now we have a new question of 
Is the inverse true here? If an attachment can be vacated on the ground that in reality the foreign depositor's money has been attached, uh, well, then shouldn't you be able to attach the foreign depositor's money too? If you've got claims against those foreign depositors, shouldn't you be able to seize it on the same premise? Uh, it is an open question. It's a theory. It's something that we wanted to discuss here today. And uh, I think now we'll turn to some questions for the floor. Yep, gentleman at the back. know it really, really well. And um, in fact, Ed Davis has the uh, Sergeant Al-Salep portion of it. And for whatever it's worth, uh, every lawyer that I've talked to, and I know this, the record in that case really well, thinks that the court got it dead wrong. And uh, I'm not sure how far Ed's going to take that, but it doesn't even seem to be a close call. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> one of his partners who's sitting here right now who probably agrees with me on that as well. So, um, you know, right now that's the law in Florida. It's an isolated case. I don't think it holds if there are more and more actions that, yet, you know, go along the same lines as the Sergeant Asala matter. And something you might want to take a look at, at the global attachment issues that you're dealing with, because I had this uh, issue come up a long time ago, but there's a United States Supreme Court case, Shevin versus Fuentes, that addresses issues concerning notice and what a court can do pre-judgment, and you may just want to take a look at that, because that's sort of like one of the foundational cases in that area. Thank you. It's an interesting law. Thank, thank you, and obviously we're very hopeful that Ed and his team are going to be working for free to try and turn that horrible piece of uh, Florida law over which would be fabulous for all concerned. <laughs> I was just wanted to check that I'd heard straight. New York courts regard the recognition of foreign court money judgments as being a ministerial act? That's correct. Uh, there so, are so two... Let me, let me build on that. Regardless of where the defendant is? Th that's correct. The, uh, again, ministerial act, there are two... <clears throat> Excuse me. There are two intermediate appellate decisions on this point. Uh, the first case came out of the fourth department. It's about eight years old now. And in that case, similarly, you have a foreign money judgment. I believe it was an English or a Canadian judgment, so very uh, simpatico in terms of the legal systems. Um, and in that case, the, uh, the relevant appellate court, and no further appeal was taken, held that uh, no jurisdiction, personal jurisdiction, was required. Uh, now, for years, that case, because it was the only intermediate appellate case on point and no other intermediate appellate court had decided the issue, was actually binding on all of New York's trial courts. Uh, someone decided to take that uh, issue up again quite recently, and it was uh, in connection, actually, with the uh, Man al uh case, which so many people in this room are familiar with. And again, the question was presented this time to the first department. The first department, by the way, is the appellate court with direct jurisdiction over New York City. So an important court for our purposes where so many uh, of these cases are heard. And once again, the first department uh, held quite unequivocally that it is a ministerial act, no jurisdiction was required, and explicitly agreed with the fourth department case. So now, at, at this point, there, the, the foundation for the proposition is, is fairly strong. And uh, the, again, the fourth department case was, uh, I believe, an English or Canadian money judgment. The first department case is a Middle Eastern money judgment. I think that unless there's some issue with the money judgment itself that would preclude recognition, even if there were jurisdiction, the, the fact that there is no personal jurisdiction is not an impediment to recognition in New York. And remember, what we're talking about is recognition. What does that mean? It means you can take some discovery to see if you can find some assets and then enforce. That's the next component. You're always trying to recognize, then enforce. Okay, so no real American nexus. You simply take an, an English judgment, you go to New York, you get it recognized, and then you go to the banks and you find any U.S. dollar account. Yep. Yeah. Well, sounds like the most fun you can have with your clothes on, really, but... <laughs> 
take your word for it. <laughs> You mentioned the interplay of bankruptcy a number of times in your presentation. You're familiar with the Weisfeldner case that just came out in April that also gives the extraterritorial effect to the uh, fraudulent uh, conveyance provisions of the bankruptcy code. And it does differ with another New York bankruptcy uh, case that came out about a year ago that said the opposite. That also should be helpful for recovery efforts. Would you agree? Oh, I, I do agree, and, and but to be clear, there's let's let's differentiate between subject matter jurisdiction to hear a case and ultimate enforcement. So those are important cases, and I agree. There, there's some <laughs> disagreement over whether, on the merits, the outside of the United States, wholly outside of the United States, fraudulent transfer cases should be heard in the United States. That's that's a question of should we hear it on the merits. But let's assume that that comes out in the positive, then you deal with these questions. I think that's the best way I can answer the, the, the point. And now we've got some interference from... <laughs> Sir. Run. Everyone run. <laughs> if we're not on fire. Next question. Warren Daniel, thank you for the uh, information on the intermediary bank. I'm a retired agent uh, working in international affairs. Uh, great tool to gather information that was started 15, 20 years ago. The agents figured out that if you go to New York and put a summons or a subpoena against that, you'll get at least the uh, wire transfer information. Mm -hmm. A second, a second uh, 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 related, related act would be the uh, correspondent banks, not the ones that are foreign banks that have official U.S. subsidiaries, but the foreign banks that are using a local U.S. bank as a correspondent bank. Also, prior to the uh, Patriot Act, we used to request the data from them and you would have a, a huge fight over whether or not they controlled the data. But after the Patriot Act, there's a specific section in there after 9-11 that says that you can request the data from those correspondent banks and the local U.S. bank is required to get it for you. And if not, they have to shut down that bank. So a great tool if you're looking for data to go to the correspondent bank. Okay. I think that pretty We're much over. cuts it off. <laughs> but thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Early hour.